I reached over the wall and picked up the wall with the phone in. It was my bag. That was my, that was my phone. So, my phone is off, so I won't be shamed today. Okay, good. So, we're all here to take on a seven week meditation uh, training. And some people here are fairly well experienced with meditation, and some people, <laughs> some people are completely new to meditation. So I'm going to be focusing on those people who are completely new. However, for those who have experience, uh, this is the time, a nice seven week period of time, to up your commitment into making sure that you do a daily meditation sitting. And don't worry too much about whether the meditation is nice or not nice, it's good or it's bad, your mind is bright or is dull. But for this period of time, try and do a daily meditation sitting. And then each week we'll kind of ask, I'll ask you for feedback. Uh, some of you who are completely new, I'm not sure yet, but we might kind of break up into smaller groups and have feedback with somebody with meditation experience. Uh, very often just the act of interacting and talking with other people about your meditation really helps to uh, in, you know, help your own commitment. One of the difficulties with meditation is there is always something nicer to do. There's always something easier to do. It's always easier to pick up a newspaper, turn on the computer, uh, pick up a book. Yeah, and books are good. There's always uh, somebody to talk to. You can always turn on the TV and watch the news, watch a documentary. For me, YouTube is terrible. I can just like chain watch YouTube. Uh, one thing after another thing after another thing. Uh, I like Judge Judy. I'm a <laughs> um, stupid things like that. It's just much easier to do. And what you do is you put the meditation off. And part of the feeling is, well, if I'm going to meditate, I'm going to meditate at a time when I really feel ripe for it. So, I have a story to illustrate. I have a friend of mine and he has a house on, a, well, on an island, just in case he's watching. And he said to me, like, because I, I said to him, he knows a lot about Buddhism. I said, but you never do any meditation. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, I do meditation. You don't know if I do meditation or not. I'm like, like when do you do meditation? Like, he's a workaholic. I said, there's no way, while, and he lives at the place where he works. I said, there's no, no way you do meditation here because you have too many things. He said, yeah, yeah, I can't do it in my house here. But when I go to my island, then I can meditate. And I happen to know that on the island um, at that time, there was a lot of construction. I said, can you do the meditation while they're doing the construction? And he said, oh, no, no, I have to wait till they finish. Like, okay. I also know that his house there is a single room. It's a fairly large room, but a single room house. And I said, well, there's you and, and your wife there at the same time. And he said, yeah, I can't do it while she's in there. And then I'm like, well, so you, he said, no, I go outside and I sit with nature and it's beautiful. I'm like, well, you know, I know that even one mosquito drives you crazy. So he said, no, no, I can't go out when there's mosquitoes. And then... Um, I said, what about the hot season? He said, oh, it's too hot to go and sit outside. I'm like, so what have you got left? His idea of meditation, if it's not too hot and it's not too cold and there are no mosquitoes and his wife isn't there and he's on his island and it's nice weather, then he can meditate. That's not meditation. That's chilling out. That's relaxing in nature, which is great to do, but that's not meditation. He didn't agree with me, but there you go. Um, 
So our meditation system, our meditation practice is something that we want to try and arouse and maintain. And the biggest obstacle to meditation, in fact, is the ease of distractions. There's just always things that are easier, more habitual, that you can get involved in, that you can pick up and do instead. So the knack is not to wait until you happen to be in a really beautiful state of mind and then say, hey man, I'm a really good meditator. A good meditator is someone who will do the practice day in, day out, regardless of how your state of mind feels. You want to try and bring the meditation to every single state of mind. Okay, okay for those who are new, the path of meditation there are different reasons for people to get interested in meditation. For me, I read a book about these monks who would live up in caves on the side of the mountain. Uh, one monk, he was in Sri Lanka. And the biggest event of the day that happened to him every day was uh, eating his food. And the second biggest event was brushing his teeth. I thought, yeah, that's me. Don't need to talk to anybody. I don't have to interact with anybody. I can just be completely on my own and absorbed in, you know, super mundane states of mind and not be involved with the world. And that really suited me. I was not keen on the world and I had, didn't have too much ambition for things like jobs and relationships and things like that. Not the best motivation, right? <laughs> Other people, well, um, one uh, person that I know got diabetes and like the early stages of diabetes, so meditation was recommended as part of the meditation, the diet and the exercise in order to overcome the diabetes. And it seemed to work whether it was the diet, the exercise, or the meditation, we don't know. A friend of mine, his daughter was, uh, he was a me he's a meditation teacher, and his daughter used to go with him on meditation retreats uh, for years and years, but she wasn't interested in doing the meditation. She'd play and read and do different things. And as she got older, when she was about 16. Uh, on the meditation retreat, there was a really beautiful, really poised 20-year-old girl. And the 16-year-old was so enamored with this girl, thought she was so beautiful and so poised, that she, and if she wanted to do a meditation retreat, well then the girl would too. So she started meditating for that reason. What are your reasons for wanting to come and meditate? You know, can be all kinds of different uh, motivations. But one of the things that we find is the motivation will tend to change the more meditation that you do. Whatever it was that originally pulled you through the door, as you get involved with meditation, as you start to take up a daily practice, it gains a momentum of its own and you don't really need reasons for it. Reasons are all things part of the ego, part of the thinking. But when you get into the practice, you're really putting down that whole kind of ego, that whole I am, the whole kind of mental life that we live in, is putting that down and finding somewhere else to dwell. Now, sometimes that's easy, and sometimes that's difficult. So the biggest challenge, as I said, is to be able to do this consistently. Yesterday I was doing my meditation, and, well, actually I was trying to install Photoshop on my computer. Um, <laughs> not a happy um, time that I was having, to be honest. And. So while I was doing this, but I just wanted to sit. And every so often, every hour or so, I'd be like, ah, I've had enough. 
beating my head against a brick wall and windows hanging and crashing. And, and then I'd go and sit and my mind was just, my mind was just so beautiful and still and bright. I'm like, I don't care about Photoshop. I just want to sit right here. This is it. And so I don't know, I was doing about four or five hours of meditation yesterday. And this morning I think, you know, I have to come and give the talk today. I'll get myself into the right space for the, you know, so I can talk to you all. And then nothing. This mind jumping around backwards and forwards wouldn't settle down. Meditation is not about the experience that you're having. In those two examples last night and this morning, I'm comparing what the experience is. And it's your ego that judges, you know, I'm doing it right, now I'm getting that, oh, now I can't do it, I'm so terrible. You need to get past that kind of thinking mind. When you put the thinking mind down, well, if the mind is great or the mind's not great, that's all part of judging and thinking. That's all part of this mechanism that you're trying to actually get away from. <coughs> So the meditation needs to be uh, something that's consistent and it will take on a life of its own because it's independent to your kind of ego and what you want and what you're aiming to get from it. On the wider scale of things, the goal of meditation is called enlightenment. So. This is what saints and sages around the world have been in search of. In every tradition, in every culture, you have a group of people that kind of withdraw from society somewhat, uh, recluses, saints, sages, hermits, people who have looked at the world in the normal sense, but have seen something else. And every culture, in every age, all around the world, you've had people who do this. In Christianity, you had the Desert Fathers, the Philokalia. I don't know if anyone has tried reading that. Uh, it's quite a beautiful book if you can read it. Uh, Saint Teresa of Avila, the Spanish mystic, during the Spanish Inquisition, her and her disciple or follower, St. John of the Cross. These are real hardcore meditators. Uh, in India, you've had it. All the, the Upanishads are written from these really deep experiences that people were having. Um, China, as soon as Buddhism got to China, it was picked up very quickly because they had this feel for that ultimate goal. What is the ultimate goal, this enlightenment? Well, we can study it, we can talk about it, I can give you the definitions for it. But for this period of seven weeks, we're not too focused on what the ultimate goal is. We focus on what you need to do. So as we get into the meditation practice, we are embarking on this same path that all these people have followed before us. And so we're joining a worldwide humanity long um, tradition of people who are interested and willing to stop and turn the mind around and turn the mind back inwards on a path of discovery. So, meditation is something that we will, or one does learn only by doing it. Nobody can really teach you meditation. I can't say certain things and then you just catch it and then you can do it. I watched this documentary, again YouTube, uh, <laughs> of a small group of people who made bicycles that when you turn the steering wheel left, the wheel will turn right. And when you turn right, turn your handlebars right, the wheel will turn left. And they had great fun putting everybody on these bicycles and watching them fall off. And just one or two of the researchers were really determined to master it. And 
they tried every technique they could think of to try and master it and they just couldn't and then the guy said he said you know one day it just clicked and from that second on I could ride the bicycle and then he got back on a regular bicycle and it was you know he's falling off for a few minutes but then that clicked and then he could switch between the bicycles there was a moment where the knowledge came alive this is one way of learning things in psychology you call it insight learning that means the animal that you are testing will suddenly figure out what it is that needs to be done very briefly in psychology they had uh, two schools behaviorism um, and cognitive insight learning and the, the first school they did these experiments with cats and they put a cat in a box and the cat has to escape from the box to get the food to escape from the box it has to hit a lever when it hits the lever the door opens it gets its food you put the cat back in the box and what does the cat do? does the cat hit the lever again? no, it carries on doing random actions until eventually it hits the lever and then you put the cat back in the box poor cat, gets frustrated and slowly but slowly slowly it gets faster and faster for the cat to hit the lever but the cat never has a moment where it figures out what to do compared to monkeys uh, they had chimpanzees and they put them in a room in the room is a table, a chair and a broom and high up on the wall is some bananas hanging and the only way to get the bananas is to put the, move the table, put the chair on the table stand on the chair with the broom and you can unhook the bananas and it took a while for the chimpanzees to figure this out but the moment they'd figured it out every time you put them in that room they will immediately do that action it means that they've cognitively understood the process so to cognitively, when you get that moment where you suddenly understand something you get like a flush of happiness it's a little little boost of endorphins will go around the body I remember the, distinctly the, very, the first day that I understood how a magnet worked and it was only about three years ago um, I was watching Richard Feynman if anyone has ever anyone watched Richard Feynman it's probably one it's probably a bit old for most of you a bit young for it and I suddenly ah that's it that's how a magnet works I could never understand why you could attach a magnet to a piece of metal and it doesn't fall off but there's no battery and now I understand it don't ask me to explain it to you but. so there is a moment that we get of happiness when we have attained to new knowledge when we've understood something new but the meditation that we do is not like that meditation is something that you don't apply your mind and your intelligence and then you figured it out ah that's what it is it's not something that you can do even slowly over a matter of weeks over seven weeks you're not going to get to the end of seven weeks and then pff, now I know meditation I just go and do it and every day I sit there for an hour and I'm just hey, hey man I'm really cool it's not going to happen meditation is something that you can only learn by doing it and this was a difficulty for for many years trying to teach meditation because I was trying to make people understand and you can't it's, it's, you may understand something intellectually you may understand how a magnet can stick to the side of the fridge without the need for a battery but you'll never understand meditation and like oh that's what it is so the meditation is only something that you can learn by doing it you have to just do it it's your journey, it's you turning your attention around and bringing it inside your own mind 
you might call it a self-reflectivity. So instead of the mind pouring outwards into the things of the world, all those things that are exciting, stimulating, interesting, YouTubes and emails and books and conversations and TVs and parties and food and all the rest of it. These will all pull your attention outside of yourself. And one thing you like those things is because you're not feeling yourself. So, for example, when you go to see a movie, what's the difference between a good movie and a bad movie? The difference is, a good movie sucks you in. You get pulled into the story. If you're not pulled into the story, well, you, you know, the seat is too small and the, the person next to you is rustling toffee wrappers and someone else is scratching and you know, the air conditioning isn't right or it's too hot or it's too cold. You know, you feel, you don't like to feel yourself. We like to be completely absorbed outside of ourselves. So turning the attention back inwards is quite a job. You're reversing the flow of the mind, if you like. The Buddha called it the uh, worldly stream. And he said, you're going against the worldly stream. There are different ways to look at it. But for example, the Chinese were very much, um, when Buddhism got to China, they were very much, well, you go into the worldly stream, you go into the flow of nature. But Indian Buddhism was very clear, as you go against that worldly stream of the attention flowing outside of yourself into things to do, things to have, things to listen to, things to eat, things to occupy your attention. <clears throat> I had this one friend, he was studying Thai, and he went to the, I can never remember, Unity or Union, there's two really good schools in Thailand, in Bangkok. And the school was, at that time, um, near Prom Pong, uh, not Prom Pong, Plenjit, Plenjit Center. And he lived at Onnut. So, five days a week, he would take the Sky Train from Onnut to Plenjit. And a very good friend of mine, but he never had any interest in meditation until the very end, but that's another story. Um, and he said to me that he goes by SkyTrain, and he said, but fortunately, he said, he got his iPod. Shows how long ago that was. He said, fortunately, I've got my iPod. It's a total lifesaver. Like, why is your iPod a, a lifesaver? Because that trip from... On Nut to Plan Jit was too unbearable because he didn't have something to occupy himself with. He needed something that would just occupy his attention. Otherwise, he'd have to just feel himself, right? And he felt that was very uncomfortable. And this is true for pretty much everybody. Until you train yourself, it's always going to be more comfortable to have your attention outside of yourself into some kind of activity. Bringing the attention into yourself at first is going to be a little uncomfortable. So sometimes when people are really new to meditation, they can feel a little panicked or the breath will go too fast because you're not accustomed to it. However, what's happening is as you bring your attention in, the mind is still wavering a lot. And the mind that's wavering or moving is uncomfortable. If we keep practicing, you get accustomed to feeling yourself, knowing yourself, being wakeful. And this starts to become the most beautiful thing that you can experience. So yesterday, while I'm doing Photoshop, trying to get my Photoshop installed, you know, it took me all day and I still failed um, because it's not as nice. It's better to bring my attention inside. My attention is home. 
my attention is still, my attention is bright, I don't need to go anywhere at all. This is what we call a refuge. There's a technical word, it's called a sarana or refuge. And a refuge means it's a place that you can place your mind which doesn't depend on anything. Doesn't depend upon having the right food to eat. Food is a really big thing, you know. You might not think it is, but you come and live in the monastery and you get the kind of food that we have to eat. And, you know, within a few days you're starting to realize what a big thing food is for most people. I had a friend of mine, he, he, he had gout and the doctor told him drink water. He's like, I don't like to drink water. I mean, like our food obsessions are so strong that they'll even be, prefer illness to changing our kind of food and drink habits. So this uh, refuge doesn't depend upon having the right food, doesn't depend upon having a nice building or a nice house or a nice place, doesn't depend on having the nicest people around you, doesn't depend upon your partner. You know, so many people I know, their happiness depends on their partner. It's not a very reliable place to, <laughs> to ground your sense of happiness in your partner, right? Other people are not uh, terribly reliable. Who was it said hell is other people? It was Sata, was it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you have developed this refuge, what happens is that like, you have a place to place your mind, which is always there, it's always right. It's independent of the states of mind. This is important. Because meditation is not making your state of mind very happy and very beautiful. It's having a place to rest independent of the state of mind. So your state of mind may be highly agitated, may be unhappy, it may be bright, it may be dull. Behind all of those states of mind actually is this really cool, bright, clear, awake resting place. It's right there, right? In fact, it's so close to you, you don't notice it. And this is what we are trying to cultivate through the meditation. Some years ago, I had this crazy doctor told me I had cancer, which I didn't, but um, he told me I had lymphoma. And um, I don't like hospitals at the best of time. In fact, just going anywhere near a hospital, in fact, even just the word makes me feel a bit queasy. And so I was already feeling very out of sorts. And then he said, you know, you, I think you really may well have lymphoma. I'm like, oh man. And then I went to, I went to lie down because I was feeling all dizzy. And he, <laughs> he said to me one of the most stupid things I've ever heard in my life. He said, why are you lying down? I said, I just need a minute to stop. And he said, why? I said, because, like, what do you mean, why? Are you just because I don't want to die. And he said to me the most utterly ridiculous thing. He said, why are you afraid of dying? You're a monk. <laughs> You're not helping the situation here. Even while that was happening, I could still feel this sense of refuge. There was still this sense of the, this stillness place of stillness, a place of brightness, a place of alertness that was independent of even that feeling, even being afraid that I'm going to die. It was 12 years ago, I'm not dead yet, so I should go back and see him really, shouldn't I? So, the, we, this is what we're trying to develop, this sense of refuge, and it's right there inside you, it's right there in or amongst or between every single state of mind that you can possibly have. It's right there. It's going to take some digging out. And to dig it out takes time. It takes commitment. And seven weeks won't do it. Seven months won't do it. 
Uh, this is at least a lifetime practice. At least a lifetime practice. You never really get to the point where you say, okay, now I know how to, I can do meditation. There's always more and more layers, there's always more and more tricks that the mind will play upon you. So at least one lifetime. That's why I wrote upon here, above all, be patient. So we're going to do some uh, meditation and we're going to go back to the very basic core method for meditation, which is to sit and watch the breathing. The breathing is a meditation object and you can have any one of hundreds or thousands of different meditation objects. Usually meditation objects are things like a mantra, that you, words that you can recite. Visual things, if you're very visual you can focus on things that you can see, uh, from light to a candle to a, you know, even to a very intricate bodhisattva picture and really strongly visualize. Uh, those are some. There are many body-based forms of meditation. Uh, we do the Qigong here every Thursday. Uh, it's a good way to bring your attention in the body. We do walking meditation. Um, but amongst all of these different meditation objects that you can use, the one that we use most commonly is the breathing. And there are a couple of good reasons for this. One is... When you sit and when you do the meditation, we make sure that on the in breath the abdomen expands, on the out breath the abdomen contracts. This is called yogic breathing, and if you are stressed or in a difficult situation, then you would tend to breathe in at the chest. So you watch boxers when they're fighting and when they sit down in the corner after you know between rounds. They're breathing in at the chest here, right? When you get stressed, you will tend to breathe in using the chest muscles, which are actually a lot stronger than the abdomen muscles, but um, they use up a lot of energy. When we breathe in from the abdomen, it means that we are relaxed. So when we come to do the meditation, if you make sure that the, you're doing the abdominal breathing, the abdomen expands with the in-breath, contracts with the out-breath, this will automatically key you into a calmer state of mind. It's called a biofeedback mechanism. This is the reason why when police come to your house and give you bad news, they tell you to sit down and have a glass of water ready. Because when you're drinking water, it signals to yourself, well, if I'm eating and drinking, I must be in a reasonably calm situation. When you're stressed, you don't usually want to eat or drink, unless it's ice cream. <laughs> So, the breathing, especially from the abdomen, will signal to you that this is a, a time when you're feeling in a safe and relaxed place and has that biofeedback mechanism onto the mind. Second thing is, the breath will be a very good barometer, will indicate to you how you're feeling at the moment. And the whole idea of meditation, or insight meditation that we do here, is that you start to really see yourself more clearly. Okay? I could tell you how to change. I could tell you be more compassionate, be nicer, you know, feed the cats and, you know, ask your children what they're studying at school and I could blah, blah, blah. I could do all kinds of things. Um, you could do the same with me. There's plenty of things in life that I do wrong. To simply use the, like the ego or the intellect to say, well, this is how you should be, or this is how I should be, is not a very good long-term plan. It's not going to change you very much. Years ago, I went from England to New Zealand because it was as far away from England as I could get. And on the flight there, I, had, I invented an entirely new character that I was going to be. Forget this 
other person in England. Now I'm going to be this completely new character. I can clean the board. Of course, within two weeks, I'm exactly the same as I was when I left England because I'd carried the exact same personality along with me. Setting forth goals, I'm going to be like this or this or this, it's not going to change you very much. We do do this kind of work, it's called aditana or resolution, and this is when we do things like bowing practice or uh, chanting practices. So we can take a long-term deliberate conscious effort to change our behavior. But in Buddhism, the thing that the tool that we use is called insight. And insight means that you are being aware of yourself. As I discussed earlier, most of the time, most of you are not aware of yourself. You like to be aware of what you're eating, what you're doing, who you're talking to, what you are looking at, where you are driving, what you are planning, anything except feel yourself. So our vehicle of change in the meditation is observation. Neither I nor anybody else is going to tell you how you should be. It's up to you yourself to determine that with your own intelligence and your own wisdom. But the meditation will give you a tool whereby you can see how you are. And seeing how you are is what will start to change you in a way that your ego can't, your intellect can't do it. You can't set forth those kind of goals. Those people who have been meditating a long time, you know, you get days or months when you feel like you're really cracking it and like, oh yeah, I've got it going, and then months when it just doesn't seem to work. That's just the waves on the surface of the ocean. The undercurrents to the ocean is what will really move you and change you. And when you look back over five years, ten years, twenty years, then you say, oh, that's that is a complete change. I know for myself that before I was doing meditation, my happiness just depended upon other people and other things so much of the time. It depended on my parents, it depended on my friends, it depended on my car. All these kind of things that I was so invested in. And these days my happiness doesn't really depend upon anybody. It depends upon me and me alone. You know? Sometimes I get really beautiful places to live and to be in. And sometimes, you know, I get really terrible situations. I stayed in Gotsamui in this Kamalaya resort, is it? It's, uh, he knows it, very well, plush, high-class, expensive resort. And I had three nights there, I was like, oh, this, is the life, this is the life, you know, the life of a monk come here. Another time I was in the temple and um, I just rolled up and asked to stay the night and they put me in this really disgusting room, like I'd spit all up the walls, there was no windows, and, uh, full of mosquitoes and, you know, some days you get good, some days you get bad. My happiness doesn't depend upon the things around me, anymore. it only depends upon myself. So as you sit and breathe, the breathing is a very good barometer. It will start to point to you how you are actually feeling. And this turning the attention back inwards and starting to uh, observe, know thyself. Wasn't that written above the, uh, the uh, Delphi, the Oracle of Delphi? It was written a Greek phrase, know thyself. I'm looking at you here. Socrates. Yeah, but it was written above the doorway of the entrance to the, uh, the where the Oracle of Delphi was, uh, written, know, know thyself. So that's what we're trying to do, you're trying to know yourself, bring your attention back, and your breath will be, be a very good indicator. As you sit and watch the breath, you'll feel like a thought coming to the mind, and the thought starts to call your attention, and it disrupts your breathing. If you're in touch with your breathing, you start to get really in touch with what's happening in your mind. So, the breath is a very good meditation object. There are many. Uh, none are really better than others, but 
the breathing is a good one to start with. Certainly, I wouldn't usually recommend any kind of meditation object that isn't body-based. So you need to be based in the body somewhere. Some people use the body sweeping, the attention coming up and down the body is good. I like to use the whole body as itself in like a neutral aspect where it just kind of hums and vibrates and buzzes. Uh, but whatever it is, your meditation does need to be grounded in the body and does need to be grounded in the present moment, not wandering off into the past or the future. The past or the future may arise, may have a memory come up of something that happened, but you're not getting lost or caught in that memory, you're seeing it very clearly, what's happening right now. This memory has come up into my attention, and I'm keeping my attention in the present moment, and that memory will disappear. What we're not trying to do is psychology, and I am a fan of psychology, but that's not what we're trying to do. So a thought comes up, something in the past, somebody hurt you, somebody accused you of something you didn't do. I have a funny story about that, if you want, I'll tell you later. Someone uh, accuses you of something you didn't do and you get all that blame. 20 years later, you can still feel it, right? That memory comes back in and you still kind of like start arguing and trying to defend yourself. And it's ridiculous, really. This is just a little tickle, a little memory that popped up right now. Right? In, you're in the present moment, this thing has come to try and disturb you for a while, and then it will disappear. So grounded in the present moment, even if the past or the future thoughts will arise. As you focus on the breath, what will happen is the breathing comes in, the breathing goes out, the breathing comes in, the breathing goes out, the breathing comes in, and the mind says, okay, I've got that. I'll leave 10% of me watching the breath, and the other 90% of me is going to go and plan dinner, or argue with my partner, or plan my retirement, or plan my visa. That's a big one for me right now. <coughs> That's the end of your meditation, right there. Because any repetitive action, your mind is automatically geared, environment, you know, um, evolutionarily programmed, that any repetitive action it can safely ignore. And it just pays attention to, you know, other things. So the breathing comes in, the breathing goes out, just like you're walking down the street, your foot, left foot goes, your right foot goes, and then you're off thinking, right? So, what we have to do then is stop. When you realize your attention has wandered away onto something else, stop. Ask yourself this question, well, how come my mind went somewhere I didn't tell it to go? Whose mind is this? Why, why am I not in control of my mind? And then you bring your attention back to the breathing. Now, those places where the mind wanders off to and how we deal with that, we're going to look at in a future week. But for this week, for those of you who are new to meditation, all you need to do is stop. Make a note, where did your mind wander off to? Bring it back to your breathing. Try to get yourself accustomed to just feeling that simple feeling of the breath and being content with that. Contentment isn't something that arises because you like it. Contentment is something that you train yourself in. You train yourself to say, the breath is absolutely all I need. Just to sit here and breathe is absolutely everything that I need. Your cat can do it. <laughs> your dog can do it, your baby can do it can just sit as an animal, can just sit and breathe. Be like a big gorilla. Do you know that theory about human beings, why we're so smart? <laughs> if you compare us to gorillas, some of us probably closer than others, uh, for apes, our babies uh, take a long time to develop compared to other animals, like a giraffe, 
can run after like 10 minutes of being born. You know, human takes three years, so we take a long time to develop. But while we're developing, our brains have this huge plasticity where we can learn new things. That's why your 10-year-old can learn a language faster than you can, because they have this enormous learning potential, social learning potential when you're very young. And then for apes, as you get older, you lose that. You, you no longer need to learn things. Well, as humans, what happened to us was that uh, we never got mature, which is why we're not, we never get hairy like an ape. Um, we get stuck in that learning phase so that, you know, you may think you're very smart, but you're really just a kind of um, unmatured ape. <laughs> so I like to think of this because when you see a gorilla on TV, you know, a big gorilla, they just kind of sit there and breathe, right? They can just sit there and be in their group, in their situation, and all the little gorillas are bouncing around and running here and there and climbing all over you and biting things and biting each other and turning somersaults. But the adult gorillas are just sitting there and being and breathing. So I really like this image for when I do the meditation. This is my big gorilla time. My baby monkey time, that's when I'm doing other things. But my meditation, that's big gorilla time. I can just sit and be with my breath. I'm strong enough, I'm good enough. I'm, everything is just as I need it to be. That takes a training, to train yourself to be happy with the breath. Just before we do some meditation, I mentioned the mind is like a machine. And that is, whatever you put your attention onto, your mind will take on that characteristic. If you put your mind onto fluffy kittens, and you like fluffy kittens, your mind will start to become kind of nice and kindly and compassionate. If you put your mind onto Donald Trump, and you don't like Donald Trump, after a while your mind will become agitated and unhappy, maybe angry. If you like Donald Trump, we won't go there. <laughs> Whatever it is that you put your mind onto, your mind will take on that characteristic. Okay. So, you, you know, you put your mind onto a person, do you like them or do you not like them? After a while, your mind will get into this liking and disliking, hating and loving. Okay. So what we're trying to do the meditation is put your mind onto something that's neutral. The breath is not great, it's not bad, it's not comfortable, it's not uncomfortable. It's just nice, calm, present. So train yourself to be happy with that. You do this intentionally at first, but every so often the mind will just come together and stop still with the breath and you'll just be... You just realize you're sitting there and bright and breathing and still and absolutely happy. Then the mind says, yeah, now I'm doing it, and then you're off again. Your ego took control. So, the mind is just a machine like this. Whatever you put your attention onto, that's how your mind will start to become very quickly. I don't know, he's... He was my closest friend for many years. We don't see each other much these days. But whatever I would present to him, he would just embody it. So he would say something like, you know, oh, I can't get the computer to working today. And I say, oh, computers are awful. Oh, they're terrible. I have so much problem. Oh, I have so many problems. And he spirals into this kind of like angry, fed up person. And then I'll say like, it's nice weather outside. And go, oh, isn't it nice? I'm so glad I'm not in Germany and blah, blah, blah. And then he bzzz, become an old bright and happy. And then, you know, I'd say, uh, oh, you're so lucky to have such good food here. He said, oh, you know, we have great food here. I'd literally remote control him. I could just press the button and, and flip him into any mood that I wanted to flip him into. <laughs> so the mind is like that. Whatever the, is in conscious attention, you start to become that thing. So, use a bit of wisdom. Let's train ourselves to put our attention onto something that's calm, is peaceful, that is very close to yourself, 
that will give you a very good indication of what's going on in your body and mind. Expect the mind to go off wandering onto other things. That's its nature. That's, that's how you've trained your mind for 20, 30, 50 years, however old you are, 70 years, some of you, right? You've trained the mind to be looking for things that are exciting, stimulating, interesting, right? Of course your mind will carry on doing that when you do the meditation. So, the process is one of continually coming home. Everybody clear enough? Do you think we can do it? 20 minutes meditation? Okay? Okay. <clears throat>